I'm going to make the assumption that most of you in this room are familiar with that great 90s sitcom, Seinfeld. All right. One of the things I liked about Seinfeld, and one of the things I think is the genius of the script writers of that show, is that they could often deal with a sensitive topic, but yet they would hold that topic uh, in a lighthearted, uh, yet respectful fashion. Remember, uh, case in point, remember the Muffin Tops episode? Anyone? Okay, a couple of you remember that? If, if you know the show, and if you know the characters of the show, you can imagine Elaine uh, coming up with this genius idea. This genius idea to produce and sell the tops of the muffins only. Because you can kind of imagine Elaine. She's like, she's like, look, we all know that all anybody wants is the top of the muffin. Nobody wants the muffin stuff. We want the top of the muffin. It's the top of the muffin that has uh, all the texture that we desire and the flavor and has the pop. And then she goes, top of the muffin. (laughs) So in a kind of circuitous turn of events, and this is a subplot, she eventually uh, starts a bakery with her old boss, Mr. Lippman, if you remember Mr. Lippman. And they start a bakery where they produce muffins, and they literally rip the top off the muffin, discard the muffin stump, and sell the muffin tops. And of course, since everyone loves the muffin top and not the muffin stub, it becomes a big hit. Uh, The store's doing big-time business, but they run into a problem. What do they do with all the muffin stubs? And so Elaine says, well, let's give them to the homeless shelter. Now, you can imagine where this is getting ready to go, right? A couple of days later, in comes a livid shelter director. There's no way I can re- reproduce this scene, but she's got her hands on her hips and you know, the head's doing like this. And she's like, what? You think the homeless don't like muffin tops too? <laughs> sure. Pointing her finger. Sure. Give the homeless the muffin stubs. They'll eat anything. What's wrong with you? And of course, if you know Elaine, in typical Elaine fashion, she begins to argue the inarguable at that point, and then it just becomes even funnier. Muffin tops. Who really wants the muffin stub? You know, I'm getting ready to pivot, right? Last weekend, I was at Myers Park Presbyterian Church uh, attending a conference, actually co hosting a conference. And in the midst of that conference, as a side conversation, it wasn't a part of the work we were doing, as a side conversation um, with one of their assisting ministers, Deborah Connor, uh, it comes up, um, the topic comes up about their outreach ministry to and importantly with the homeless on their campus. Now I need to pause for a point. Um, most of you in this room, I imagine, are familiar with Myers Park. I had someone in the uh, 8.30 crowd who's recently from L.A., and they're like, oh, no. Okay. It's, like, it's the Beverly Hills of Charlotte. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. I get that. I can, I can relate to that. And if you've, if you've ever been to Myers Park Presbyterian or seen it, you know it is an enormous, gorgeous, ornate, multi-building campus. Beautiful stone, cavernous interiors, uh, beautifully decorated, richly decorated. Um, And so you you have now an idea of the campus if you haven't seen it before. And so on this campus, one of the new buildings they built is this large uh, outreach center. And and so she's talking about this homeless ministry uh, for and with the homeless that's housed in this building. And one of the people listening to this conversation kind of scratches her heads and was like, well, you don't mean the actual ministry's housed in this building. You mean you kind of do the preparatory work and then you take what you prepared you know, downtown to the North Tryon Corridor where most of the services for the homeless, you know, are are established and where the homeless community tends to um, gather in community. And she was like, no, no, they, it's housed here in our building. They come here. And so the next question was, well, how many really walk all the way from North Tryon uh, to Myers Park? How many are really willing to make that trip? on foot. 
And it's Deborah's response to that question uh, that reminded me of the muffin tops, but her, her response was poignant. She said, oh, yes, lots and lots of them come to Myers Park. They desire and enjoy the beauty and sense of security that this neighborhood has to offer every bit as much as you and I do. Does that hit you the way it hit me? They enjoy and desire the beauty and sense of security that this neighborhood, Myers Park, has to offer as much as you and I. With the exclusion of our psalm this morning, the underlying fundamental principle upholding the rest of our text is that theological proclamation is the fundamental proclamation of the gospel that God loves all of us equally. God's love for each and every one of us is unequivocal. Proverbs says God is the maker of the rich and the poor. God is the lover of the clean and the unclean, the Jew and the Gentile, the educated and the uneducated, the heterosexual and the homosexual, the first world human and the third world human. God is the maker and lover of them all. I'm so thrilled you picked the uh, sequence hymn that you did, Yesu. Fits perfectly with the theme of today's scriptures. James takes that fundamental principle of the gospel, that foundational theological theme of God's unequivocal love for all, and he turns that theological coin because the flip side of that theological coin is the golden maximum of all the world's religions, including our own, that says, love your neighbor as yourself, treat your neighbor. And Jesus clearly defines who our neighbor is elsewhere in the gospel. It's it's everyone. Treat them in the way that you would want to be treated if the shoes were on the other feet, if your life positions were reversed. We hear that all the time. Have you ever truly tried to practice it? Wear that for a day as your spiritual discipline. Try it if you haven't before. Take a pause before every single encounter you have with another human being, whether it be a physical encounter or a thought encounter. Take a moment to pause and imagine how you would like to be treated by you if you were in their shoes. It's hard stuff. There seems to be something deeply embedded in the human, in the human condition. That, and, and perhaps chalk it up to, you know, survival, the fittest, whatever you want. There's something deeply embedded in the human condition that seems to assert itself and say, no, love yourself, care for yourself, love those close to you, care for those close to you, above and before others. In sociology, there's a term for that. It's called tribalism, and it is universal. Tribalism manifests itself in every human culture across all space and all time. There is no other from God's perspective. It's a false dichotomy. We are all made by God, and loved by God. There is no other. We are just simply children of God. In my opinion, Jesus' humanity is on full display this morning in the gospel. There are commentators that like to whitewash over this story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. I prefer to take the gospel at face value. I don't think it would have been included by the gospel writers if it weren't true at face value. 
Most of the gospel writers are more than happy to whitewash something over if they want to, to add some context to it, some explanation. That doesn't happen with this story. A Gentile, an other, if you're a Jewish person living at this time in the world, an other comes to Jesus in a desperate situation, her daughter needing healing, and Jesus, in a most insulting fashion, rejects her, rejects her. Up to this point, it's especially clear in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus, for the most part, considers his ministry to be to his people. He is the Savior. Savior means bringing uh, healing and wholeness. He has come to bring healing and wholeness to his people. Common Jewish view. He's just part of the society in which he's brought up in. He has not come to be the Messiah to other people. And I'm convinced I can almost imagine, we tend to read this passage and we read Jesus' response to her retort straight through, but I can imagine there's a pause. And it's probably an eternal pause in Jesus' soul where all of a sudden that last barrier to universal love collapses. It's in her retort that I think something fundamentally shifts in Jesus. Oh, yes. God's love is an unconditional love love for everyone. There is no other. If you continue to read uh, the narrative trajectory of the Gospels, it's from this point that it becomes more and more clear that Jesus' arms continue to open wider and wider until in the climax of the Gospel of John, Jesus is embracing all people and dying for all people. For those of you who maybe have been reading my blog of late that accompanies the new website, uh, I know I posted this either yesterday or two days ago, but I'm not willing to let it go, and it keeps coming back to me. It's the iconic, what has now become in just a few brief days, an iconic image. It's the image of Aylan, um I already forgot his last name, Curdy. You know what I'm talking about? Picture of Aylan's three-year-old lifeless body lying on a Turkish beach. I'm going to pick on my wife for just a moment, but it's because her heart's uh, much bigger than mine. I asked her, I said, have you read the story behind the image? Have you read the heart-wrenching story of this family? of this father who had zero opportunity, whose family was facing violence and death, who's simply trying to make a better life for his family. All the barriers are up. He felt, he felt he had no other uh, opportunity in life, and so he took this risk. And now he has no family. He struggled in the water trying to hold his three-year-old and his five-year-old and his wife who was injured until his physical powers just couldn't allow him to hold on anymore. He had to let go one by one. Can you imagine? And so I responded to my wife. I was like, you have to read this story. You can't not read this story. It is the human story. God demands for us to read this story, no matter how much it rips our heart wide open. I want to be very clear, and you can tell I'm a little bit passionate about this. I offer, I have no answer to the crises of immigration that's facing uh, wealthy Western nations. And make no mistake, the afflicted are at our gates, if we're going to quote the Proverbs text today. They are there. I have no idea what the right answer is to this immensely complex crisis and situation. There are issues of fairness. There are issues of security. There are Um, issues of of concerns for overburdening economic and cultural systems. I get all that. Those are important variables that need to be considered in the equation. It is a difficult, complex situation. So I offer no suggestions. But what I feel compelled to throw out there as a Christian preacher, as a preacher of the gospel, is the suggestion that fundamental, undergirding all of the conversation that is taking place and is going to continue to take place around these crises and this issue has to be the fundamental proclamation that God 
loves all of us equally and that as children of God, we are called to embody that love and treatment of neighbor as if the shoes were on the other feet. What that's going to look like, I don't know. There can be, and I'm willing to proclaim boldly, there can be no room for tribalism and tribalism's ugly stepsister prejudice in the conversation. We have to ensure that those two elements are rid and galled and devoid. And then we will come to God's solution, whatever that might be. It's a tough call in our personal and community, communal lives to live up to the golden maxim, to follow in Jesus' footsteps and love unequivocally all people. It's a tough call. But I'm convinced that God believes we're up to the challenge. Otherwise, it wouldn't be there in the scriptures. Otherwise, we wouldn't be called to love a neighbor over and over and over again. The image of God is implanted in us just as the image of God was implanted in Jesus. Man, I'm praying for a breakthrough, and I'm pretty certain you join me. Amen.